Good morning. Glad to have you here as we worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ this morning. Um, I'm just going to begin with a few announcements. Um, the first is that we have our annual corn roast coming up in two weeks. So two Sundays from now on Sunday, September 15th, after the service, we will share lunch together uh, outside, hopefully. Uh, the weather will be good and we'll have corn and we'll, have, we'll provide all the food. We'll provide all the dishes and everything. You just need to come. And if you are able, you can bring um, a, a lawn chair or a blanket or something to sit outside. If not, we have other chairs you can use, but that's the only thing uh, you need. We would just love to have you join us uh, for lunch in two weeks after the service. Um, also, a couple things that are starting up. Uh, we have our Thursday daytime Bible study group um, is going to be kicking off on September 5th with a potluck lunch at 11 a.m. And then they're going to have their regular 10 o'clock to 11.30 studies on the Thursdays after that. Uh, for more information, talk to Lynn or Rick, uh, whose Rick I see is at the back there. Um, there will also be, starting in October, um, a seven-week uh, course that I'll be doing on, called What Do Christians Believe? This is an opportunity to explore how we summarize uh, our faith as Christians um, in a way that um, can help us explain it to other people. Um, today, I, I've had several people already let me know that they're interested in the course, and if you let me know by the end of today, uh, I'm going to send out an, a survey to those people so that they can have a say in what date and time it falls on. So if you want to be a part of the choice of what day and time this is going to be, um, please let me know that you're interested by the end of today. And then this week, <clears throat> I will send out a little poll and we'll sort things out uh, just to try and find a date and time that works for as many people as possible. Um, and then I have one more announcement um, that uh, didn't make it into the bulletin uh, or email, um, but that is that we're going to have a town hall meeting this Saturday, September 7th at 1 p.m. here at the church. And this is a, a meeting that's especially important for members um, it's just some information uh, that we need to share with you about some decisions we may have to make in the future. If you're not a member, of course, you're welcome to come. But if you're a member, um, we, we highly urge, I guess is the verb, or ask you to um, be there this Saturday at 1 p.m. if you're free. We'll send you out an email reminder of that, members, uh, a little bit later today. All right. So, our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 15, which reads, Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? The one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor and casts no slur on others, who despises a vile person but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath even when it hurts, and does not change their mind, who lends money to the poor without interest, who does not accept a bribe against the innocent. Whoever does these things will never be shaken. Will you please bow with me in worship? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercy, but we also thank you for your holiness, that you are a good God, who desires us to be like you. And so, Heavenly Father, we pray this morning that you would open our eyes to the vision you have to transform us into the likeness of your Son, who is truly good. Lord, may we be captivated by that vision, and may we pursue it with your help. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to sing an opening hymn this morning. It'll be in the blue book in the ch under the chair in front of you. Uh, it'll be right near the beginning, number three. So if you can count one, two, three, you'll be there. So this is hymn number three. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Would you please stand with me as we sing?
please be seated. For our prayer this morning, uh, I would like us to pray together the prayer our Lord Jesus taught us to pray, often called the Lord's Prayer. So if you know it, feel free to pray aloud with me. If not, I invite you to just pray along with us in your heart. Would you please bow with me as we pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. After teaching this prayer to his disciples, the Apostle Matthew records that Jesus then spoke these words, saying, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Therefore, having now confessed your sins to the Lord and your forgiveness of others, May you rest assured in the promise of Jesus' forgiveness of you. Amen? Amen. I'd now like to uh, invite Leland and family to come forward. We're going to have a Bible presentation this morning. And so um, we do this uh, usually at the end of the school year. This time it's going to be at the beginning of the school year because Leland had, had shot off on holidays right away. And uh, so we missed the chance to present this to him at the end of this past year. Um, but this is an opportunity we always give for families to present uh, Bibles to their kids uh, right around the middle school year. So we invite Leland to come. So what's going to happen is uh, read a bit of a letter and say some words to you, Leland, and then they're going to give you your Bible. Okay. <laughs> for those of you that don't know me, I'm Leland's mom, and I usually have a whole lot of things to say, but not so much without definitely starting to cry. So I'm just going to say... Um, how really proud of Leland I am as a human being, as a little boy, who's not so little anymore. Um, but <laughs> I'm, I'm very proud of the young man that he is becoming, and I'm very, very proud of his walk with God. Well, unlike my daughter, I'm never short of words. <laughs> I wrote a letter to, to Leland for presenting, and so I'm going to talk to Leland. <laughs> the first time you came to this church with me was a happy day, but it was even happier the next Sunday when you said you wanted to come. I watched you grow to be a kind, compassionate young man, but to see you growing stronger in your walk with the Lord is the greatest growth of all. There will be bumps along life's road, there always are for Christians or non-Christians alike. But if you always remember to frog, you remember what that is? Fully rely on God. If you always remember to frog, he'll guide and help you through any situation. Finally, when the world seems bigger than God, read Psalm 90. When you need courage, read Joshua 1. And if people seem unkind, read John 15. Mom, Grandpa, Auntie and I will love you every day of our lives. But more importantly, God will love you every day of yours. Remember, WWJD and Frog, and you'll be fine. We love you. And that's your Bible. Right. This time I'd like to invite the worship team forward. Um, 
I, we are going to have the kids head out to Adventure Time, but just before they do, I'm going to pray for them. Would you please bow with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we give thanks for the gift of kids. We give thanks for the reminder that we are your children. And as um, you have provided for us and make space for us to come to you, you also do that for our own children. And so we pray that as they go now for their time of learning and worship, we pray that you would open their minds and soften their hearts to understand and believe in your son, Jesus Christ, and find the joy that comes in knowing him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, kids, you're free to head on out to Adventure Time. And now it's our time for the prayers of our community. So this is our opportunity to bring before God um, three things. Our thanksgivings for what we recognize he has done in our lives, any requests or uh, things we would like to ask for for his help, uh, or any word of encouragement that you feel the Lord may have given you to share with your brothers and sisters in Christ, whether that's something he's done recently in your life, whether through a time of prayer that's something he wanted you to share with others. Um, any three of those things, just raise your hand and from where you're seated, share it in a clear voice, and then I will wrap it up in a prayer at the end. All right, let's pray. Would you please bow with me? Heavenly Father, we come before you today recognizing that you are a God who has made a way for us, that in spite of our shortcomings and our sins, you sent your son Jesus Christ, who through his death and resurrection has made us uh, your children, has brought about what was necessary to adopt us into your family so that we can now come to you in prayer and know that you hear every cry that we make. And so, Heavenly Father, And Lord, we also want to give you thanks for our community as a church um, and the opportunities you give us to support each other. We thank you for Leland, uh, who was presented with a Bible by his family this morning. And uh, we thank you um, for the mutual love and support that goes on as we recognize each other and significant points and moments in our lives. And so, Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us to do this more, that we would have eyes to see each other and to see opportunities to speak into each other's life with words of encouragement and correction when needed and all the other different things that come along with loving each other well. We pray this because with confidence, because we know you are perfect at doing this, that through your son, Jesus Christ, you have given us the supreme example of love and encouragement, of correction and guidance into truth. And so we pray now that you continue to guide us in his name. Amen. All right, at this time, I'm going to invite Pam to come and read scripture for us. And I've given her a long reading, so you'll have to, you know, if you need to stand and stretch, you have permission to do so. Because uh, this is, when I read it, it takes at least about six, six and a half minutes. Uh, so get comfy. <laughs> I'm just going to say the teacher in me won't let you crawl out down the sides out the back. I noticed those things. <laughs> We're reading today from Amos, the first three chapters up to uh, verse 8 in chapter 3. First of all, I think, it's, I think it's interesting, though, to share with you that the name Amos actually means carried by God, which is important in this reading. And Amos was actually called because God recognized there was lots of injustice and oppression going on, and he was provoked. He was provoked because his people were moving away from him and, and not living in relationship with him. And the whole point of all of this is sounds like really mean language, but it's God calling people back to relationship with him. 
So let's keep that in mind as we're reading. Uh, find it in your pew Bibles and settle back, get comfy. Let's begin. The words of Amos, one of the shepherds of Tekoa, the vision he saw concerning Israel two years before the earthquake, when Uzziah was king of Judah and Jeroboam son of Jehoash was king of Israel. He said, the Lord roars from Zion and thunders from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds dry up and the top of Carmel withers. So this is what the Lord says. For three th sins of Damascus, even for four, I will not relent. Because she threshed Gilead with sledges having iron teeth, I will send fire on the house of Hazael that will consume the fortresses of Ben-Hadad. I will break down the gate of Damascus. I will destroy the king who is in the valley of Avon and the one who holds the scepter in Beth Eden. The people of Aram will go into exile to Kerr, says the Lord. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Gaza, even for four I will not relent. Because she took captive whole communities and sold them to Edom, I will send fire on the walls of Gaza that will consume her fortresses. I will destroy the king of Ashdod and the one who holds the scepter in Ashkelon. I will turn my hand against Ekron till the last of the Philistines are dead, says the sovereign Lord. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Tyre, even for four I will not relent because she sold whole communities of captives to Edom, disregarding the treaty of brotherhood. I will send fire on the walls of Tyre that will consume her fortresses. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Edom, even for four I will not relent, because I pursued her bro his brother with a sword and slaughtered the women of the land, because his anger raged continually and his fury flamed unchecked, I will send fire on Teman that will consume the fortresses of Basra. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Ammon, even for four I will not relent, because he ripped open the pregnant women of Gilead in order to extend his borders, I will set fire on the walls of Rabbah that will consume her fortresses amid war cries on the day of battle, amid violent winds on a stormy day. Her king will go into exile, he and his officials together, says the Lord. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Moab, even for four I will not relent, because he burnt to ashes the bones of Edom's king, I will send fire on Moab that will consume the fortresses of Kerioth. Moab will go down in great tumult amid war cries and the blast of the trumpet. I will destroy her ruler and kill all her officials with him. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Judah, even for four, I will not relent, because they have rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept his decrees, because they have been led astray by false gods, the gods their ancestors followed. I will send fire on Judah that will consume the fortresses of Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not relent. They sell the innocent for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They trample on the heads of the poor as on the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. Father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. They lie down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. In the house of their God, they drink wine taken as fines. Yet I destroyed the Amorites before them, though they were tall as the cedars and strong as the oaks. I destroyed their fruit above and their roots below. I brought you up out of Egypt and led you 40 years in the wilderness to give you the land of the Amorites. I also raised up prophets from among your children and Nazarites from among your youths. Is it not true, people of Israel, declares the Lord? But you made the Nazarites drink wine and commanded the prophets not to prophesy. Now then, I will crush you as a cart crushes when loaded with grain. The swift will not escape. The strong will not muster their strength. 
and the warrior will not save his life. The archer will not stand his ground, the fleet-footed soldier will not get away, and the horseman will not save his life. Even the bravest warriors will flee naked on that day, declares the Lord. Hear this word, people of Israel, the word the Lord has spoken against you, against the whole family I brought up out of Egypt. You only have I chosen of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your sins. Do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? Does a lion roar in the thicket when it has no prey? Does it growl in its den when it has caught nothing? Does a bird swoop down to a trap on the ground when no bait is there? Does a trap spring up from the ground if it has not caught anything? When a trumpet sounds in a city, do not the people tremble? When disaster comes to a city, has the Lord not caused it? Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. The lion has roared, who will not fear? The sovereign Lord has spoken, who can but prophesy? This is the word of the Lord. you please bow with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we do ask that you would soften our hearts, that we might be humbled, um, that as Paul taught us, that we would not think of ourselves more highly than we ought, but with sober minds, we should consider others better than ourselves, and that in light of thinking this way, we might carry out the great commandments to love you, our Lord, with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And so, Heavenly Father, we pray that you would open our minds and soften our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever had a wake-up call? And I don't mean someone literally phoning you to wake you up in the morning, <laughs> although you may have had one of those too. Uh, I'm referring metaphorically to the experience of having, uh, being headed in a certain direction in life. Uh, that is, you were living out a certain lifestyle or living in certain habits, and you thought those lifestyles and habits were great. And then something happened that woke you up to the fact that you needed to change how you were living that what you were doing was not okay. Have you ever had a wake-up call? Now, it could have been something small, like the experience I had in second year university, where I was staying up till 3 a.m. every night until I slept through my alarm and missed my morning class. Uh, and I had never missed a class before in my life. Uh, and funny, that was important to me. It's not always important to everybody. <laughs> but I was horrified that I had slept through a class. And sleeping through that one class woke me up to the fact that if I didn't change my behavior and start getting to bed a lot earlier, I was going to keep missing classes and that would negatively impact my grades. Uh, and thank the Lord I did change my sleeping habits. But what I'm calling a wake-up call here is that moment when it dawns on you that what you're doing needs to change. It could be as simple as realizing that you need to go to bed at 10 p.m. instead of 3 a.m., or it could be as serious as almost dying from an overdose and realizing that you need to do whatever it takes to change your life. A wake-up call is the moment that we realize we have to change, that change is no longer optional, that it's essential. And my brothers and sisters, you and I need wake-up calls in our lives. We do. In fact, I would argue that every positive change that you have ever made in your life is the result of a wake-up call. And this includes your relationship with Jesus. When Jesus is recorded as first preaching the good news of the gospel, in the gospel of Mark, he says this. He says, the time has come. Now's the time. The kingdom of God has come near. And then he commands two things, repent and and believe the good news. Now notice Jesus' command is not repent, and then you're done with that, and now then believe. It's repent and believe. In fact, those two verbs are in the present tense in Greek, which gives them what's called a continuous 
uh, expectation, that they're commands that are expected to keep on going in your life. And I think we usually understand this when it comes to believing in Jesus, not necessarily as much when it comes to repentance. I think we usually expect our lives as Christians to require us to keep on believing or trusting in Jesus as we go through our lives. That seems sort of obvious. If you want to remain a Christian, you have to keep believing in Jesus. But I think we're much more prone to forget, or maybe not even realize in the first place, that repentance is something that we're required to do our whole life long as Christians. Repentance is something that meant to be a continuing activity throughout our lives as believers in Jesus. Now to repent is to change. It's simply a specific kind of change. Repentance is about turning away from sin. That is, away from those things that are wrong in God's sight, whether they're right or wrong in the world's sight, and turning towards doing what is good in God's sight. And the simple fact is that you and I cannot repent from what is wrong in God's sight until God points out to us that our actions are wrong in his sight. In other words, in order to repent, we first need a wake-up call. And that's what the book of Amos is. The book of Amos is a wake-up call. A very serious wake-up call, in fact. It points out behavior that must change aspects of repentance that are not optional. Now, most of what we would call the writing prophets in the Bible, those Old Testament books like Amos, that are near the end of the Old Testament, whose titles simply have the name of the prophet, books like Isaiah, Jeremiah, or Zephaniah, or many others. Those are all, in a sense, wake-up calls. They all include words from God to wake up and change, to repent. And this fall, we're going to be looking at three of these shorter prophetic books. Uh, first, uh, today, we're starting the book of Amos. Then we're going to look at the book of Jonah. And finally, we'll get to the book of Micah. But of out of all of these prophetic books, I think Amos is perhaps the most dedicated wake-up call. You see, whereas the other prophetic books have lengthy passages about God's future hope and the vision of what he's bringing into the world, Amos only looks forward in hope in the last few verses of the whole book. The rest of the book, the whole rest, is essentially the message, wake up or perish. Now, of course, Telephones didn't exist in Amos' day, uh, so he couldn't use the metaphor of a wake-up call like I am today. And so Amos uses a different metaphor. He uses the metaphor of a lion's roar. Amos chapter 1, verse 2, records what many view as the summary warning of the whole book. It reads that Amos was prophesying, and he said, The Lord roars from Zion and thunders from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds dry up, and the top of Carmel withers. The, this lion's roar shows up again later in chapter 3, verse 4, where we read, Does a lion roar in the thicket when it has no prey? This describes the lion as roaring from its hiding point right before it leaps out of the thicket to attack its prey. And then in chapter 3, verse 8, Amos declares that the words the Lord has commanded him to prophesy to Israel are like this roar of warning from a lion about to attack. As we read in chapter 3, verse 8, it says, The lion has roared, who will not fear? The sovereign Lord has spoken, who can but prophesy? In other words, these, this verse pictures the words of prophecy from the Lord through Amos' mouth as the roar of Yahweh himself. A roar that's intended to inspire fear. And all of the prophecies within these, the whole, this whole section that was read to you, the whole two and a half chapters, claim to be this roaring from the Lord. Each word of prophecy in this passage begins with words, a formula of words, like we find in chapter 1, verse 3, which reads, For three sins of Damascus, even for four, I will not relent. And the phrase, I will not relent here, more literally reads, I will not relinquish it. And as Joanna Hoyt points out in her commentary, the word it here refers back to the lion's roar in verse 2. So if we filled in that word it with what it refers to, we would read this. For three sins of Damascus, even for four, I will not relinquish my roar. 
Therefore, the words God has commanded Amos to prophesy, the words recorded in this book, are meant to strike terror in the hearts of those who listen. Like the roar of a lion leaping at you out of a thicket would strike you with terror, these words are meant to strike us with terror. Or to put this another way, if you did not feel fear as you were listening to the scripture reading from Amos this morning, then you missed the point. The point of this word from the Lord is to strike our hearts with fear. Not because the Lord wants us to live in fear, not at all. Rather, because you and I need a wake-up call. We need to hear our Lord the lion roar. Why? Because no one changes until they first know they need to change. If we don't know we need to change, we won't do it. No one repents without first waking up to the terror of what will happen if they don't change. And that is what the book of Amos is about. It is about waking us up to the terror of what will happen if we don't repent. These words are meant to be a roar that inspires the fear necessary to make us change. And repentance, as Jesus has commanded, is to be a regular everyday activity for us as Christians. Therefore, it is important for us not only to hear words of assurance of things like forgiveness and love from our Lord, which we definitely need along the way, we also need to hear him when he roars when he's trying to wake us up to something that needs to change in our lives, when he's calling us back to him in repentance. And this is why the book of Amos is in the Bible. Because we still need that. We still need to be awakened to the need that we need to repent. We need to hear God, the Lion of Judah, roar at us. And so that brings us to the question of what is it that the Lord wants us to repent from? What kinds of actions, what lifestyles and habits of ours need to change? Well, to answer this question, we need a little background on Amos and his time period. You see, all of the writing prophets, without exception, expected their audience to know the background. They expected you to know the political, ethnic, and religious history of Israel. They aren't going to explain these things for us, and their message depends on understanding them. This is evident from the very first verse of Amos, which reads, the words of Amos, one of the shepherds of Tekoa, where's that? The vision he saw concerning Israel two years before the earthquake, when was that? When Uzziah was king of Judah, who was he? Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, was king of Israel, who's that? Right? If we don't know where Tekoa is, if we don't know when this earthquake he mentioned was, if we don't know who Uzziah, the king of Judah, was, or Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel, was, We're going to get lost in this thing. And even when we carry on to verse 2, if we don't know where places like Zion and Carmel are, we're not going to get the message of this book. So history history and geography are important, especially in the writing prophets. Therefore, I'm going to ask uh, Jeremy at the back there um, if he can now show the first slide uh, of... There we go. Okay, now the second slide. Aha! Here we go. We've got a map of Israel up there. So the area you see up there that's highlighted all three colors, if you take all three of those colors together, that was roughly the area controlled by King Solomon uh, by the end of his reign. However, King Solomon, near the end of his life, was led astray into worshiping other gods by his many foreign wives, and so the Lord prophesied that after he died, the kingdom of Israel would be split in two. And you can see this split between uh, the purple color at the bottom here and then this green and uh, kind of orangey color at the top. Um, Now, this split occurred in the year 922 B.C. The Lord made Jeroboam son of Nebat, or Jeroboam I, the king of the ten northern tribes of Israel, this area up here, um, and left Israel, uh, and that that area was then called Israel from then on. And the southern part that was left to Rehoboam, Solomon's son, was just Judah and Benjamin, And that was called Judah. So you have now Judah in the south and Israel in the north, even though they're all Israelites. Now, the prophet Amos was from Tekoa, which is in Judah, just south of Jerusalem, right around here. You can kind of see it. Um, That's where Tekoa is. Uh, But he was sent by the Lord to prophesy not to people in Judah, but up in the northern kingdom. So he is not a native of this northern kingdom. But he was sent there. And this is why in Amos 1 verse 2, the roar of the Lord is pictured as coming from Zion, 
That is the mountain on which the temple of the Lord was built in Jerusalem and Judah. And that this roar goes out towards Carmel, which is the mountain range that's right up here. It's the northernmost mountain range in, in Israel. Um, and uh, Nar Carmel was known uh, for being a very fertile place. It had big forests and all this kind of stuff. And you, if you um, notice that as the result of this roar, all of Carmel, we're told, which was a very fertile land, it is said to wither and dry up. So I just read that again to you. This is verse 2 of chapter 1. He says, he said, The Lord roars from Zion and thunders from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds dry up and the top of Carmel withers. So the opening picture of Amos is this picture of a lion roaring from the temple in Jerusalem out towards the northern kingdom and that all the vegetation in life all the way from here through there to the northernmost part of it withers at his roar. So it's kind of an ominous image to begin your book, right? <laughs> now, King Jeroboam, the one that I referred to earlier, the first, is not the same King Jeroboam that's referred to in this book. Uh, the King Jeroboam that's referred in this book was Jeroboam II, and he lived much later. Um, and in his reign, uh, there was a major earthquake right about in the middle of his 41-year reign. He reigned for a long time. Uh, right around the year 760. So that's about 160 years later uh, after the split between Israel and Judah. Um, which is, interestingly, I just thought it was, is about the same time Canada has existed. So it's about the same age, same t amount of time as Canada has been a country. So Amos prophesied these years, we're told, two years before this earthquake. And some think that Amos may in fact have been, uh, predicted the earthquake and that it's mentioned here in part um, to authenticate him as a prophet. So he called it two years in advance, and then it happened. Uh, anyway, regardless, in the years that were in between when Israel was divided in 922 BC, sorry, this is like a very much a history lesson, I hope you're following here, <laughs> from 922 BC uh, and Amos' prophecy, which happened around 762 BC, a lot of stuff happened. And some of that stuff is important for understanding the book of Amos. Uh, for the purpose of understanding Amos, what you need to know is that the Aram, Arameans, these guys up here in kind of the, where it says Aram, and there's Damascus as their main city, uh, those guys towards the end of this period kicked Israel's butt in military campaigns. They kicked their butt under their king Hazael and his son Ben-Hadad III, who are the guys that are named in Amos 1 verse 4, the Arabians not only took back control of their own territory, which Solomon had kind of exerted his influence over, this orangey yellow part there, they actually um, went further south and took over and, the, and controlled the area of Gilead on the east side of the Jordan River. So if you want to change to the next slide first, Jeremy, we can see. So this is Gilead, this yellow part here. This is uh, Aram came down and they not only took over this part, they took the whole basically entire east side. Uh, of the Jordan. And the Arameans uh, and the Ammonites, who are next door, see these guys here? So a Aram and Ammon, keep those things straight, hey? Eh? Uh, those two guys uh, were especially cruel to the people in Gilead at this period of time. So this is why you have the descriptions of the Ammonites um, slaughtering women, like ripping open the pregnant women. This is an awful image but they probably literally did that, as well as in um, verse 3, where the uh, Arameans are described as dragging threshing sledges with uh, iron teeth on them uh, over top of the people. Now, we don't necessarily know if they did this literally, but this is at least a metaphor. Uh, threshing sledge, if you don't know what it is, is a big heavy piece of wood that was pulled usually by an animal that had uh, stones on the bottom and was used for separating grain uh, from its stock and chaff. Uh, and so they're picturing like a big heavy piece of wood with knives on the bottom and we're going to drag that over you. That's what he's saying, how the um, Arameans treated the people in Gilead. In other words, what they did to them was horrific. And in response to this, the Lord prophesied that despite Israel's idolatry, he would have mercy on them and send people to rescue them. If you want to switch to the next side, just back, yep. There we go. Um, and these two people uh, were Jehoash, king of Israel, uh, who, is prophesied, who, uh, who Elijah, 
uh, prophesied would have three major victories over the Arameans. Uh, he pushed them back uh, and regained Gilead, kind of where it's green here. So this is kind of picturing where things were at uh, after Jehoash was done. And then Jeroboam, his son, this is Jeroboam II, continued that came and recaptured the influence over all this area up here. Uh, and so therefore, through Jeroboam II, God brought in what the commentator Shalom Paul has nicknamed the Silver Age of the Kingdom of Israel. So this was a time, a massive territorial and economic growth for Israel, which was rivaled only by the age of David and Solomon, which we might nickname the Golden Age. Now, this is important to realize because when Amos is prophesying, his lions roar against the kingdom of Israel. Israel is at that time experiencing an almost unprecedented amount of power and wealth. They've never been this powerful and wealthy since Solomon. Um, things are going really well from them, and they believe it's at the Lord's hand, uh, rightly, that, that this has happened for them, that the Lord had fully kept his promise to rescue them through, from the Arameans. It was prophesied, and it happened. But the Israelites forgot the part that what the Lord had done for them was an act of grace, it was something he did for them because even though they didn't deserve it. In other words, the people of Israel, especially their leaders, in their prosperity, became confident in the power of their army and especially even more confident that God was pleased with them. And that's why he was blessing them. And this is where they were wrong. Because the Lord was not pleased with how they were living their lives. And so he sent Amos to wake them up. Now, as Canadians today, there are, I think, many frighteningly similar parallels between us and the Israelites of Amos' day. We, too, live in a country that's roughly 160 years old, where most of the difficult times, like the Depression and First and Second World Wars, lie behind us, and unprecedented luxury and wealth and affluence are ours. We, like them, face an incredible amount of temptation to view the blessings and freedoms bestowed upon us as if they were things we deserve as if they were our rights, and as if we are free to do with them as we please. But my brothers and sisters in Christ, this is not the case. Everything we have in Canada, the many, many blessings bestowed upon us are a grace. They are an undeserved gift from the Lord. Our affluence and so-called freedoms threaten to lull us into sleep, where we feel like there's nothing in our lives that needs to change. That if there's anything that needs to change, it's somewhere out there, somewhere else in the world. And if anything difficult does come our way, we feel, I think, as if it's totally and completely undeserved. How could Canada deserve anything negative to happen to it? Right? Is that not what we are like as Canadians? And is that not frighteningly similar to the Israelites in Aram's day, Amos' day? They needed a wake-up call. And my brothers and sisters, we need it too. And so how does the Lord bring us this wake-up call? Well, he does it indirectly. In other words, he doesn't just come straight out and tell us. He, he does it by surprise. He lures us in and then hits us with it. And this is what the whole first section of Amos from chapter 1, verse 1, through chapter 3, verse 8 is structured to do. It's one big surprise meant to first lure us in before it hits us with the truth. It consists of six prophecies of doom on account of heinous sin by other nations that lead up to a seventh and final prophecy of doom. And since the number seven was the number of completion or perfection in Israel, Israelite culture, this pattern was very familiar to them and expected. In other words, as Amos would have been speaking out this formulaic phrase for three sins of so-and-so and even for four, I will not relinquish my roar, the audience would be counting them and anticipating the seventh one because that nation would be the real focus of the word of judgment. And in addition, as a prophecy or oracle against the nations, the audience would also expect all of the words that he would say to be against other nations, not them. But the Lord has a surprise in store for them. Through Amos, the Lord speaks prophecies of doom against the nations encircling Israel in the order that you can see in this next slide. So here you go. This is the order that they're given in. So you have up here, uh, that's Damascus and Aram. And then it goes over down here to Philistia. Oh, my thing's dying here. 
number two, and then three up to Phoenicia. Uh, and these three nations were completely unrelated to Israel. Uh, and then it jumps down to four to Ammon, and then five to Edom, and up six to Moab. And those countries on the southeast side are actually all distant relatives of Israel. So Ammon and uh, Moab were um, descendants of Lot, and Edom is another name for Esau, which is Jacob or Israel's brother. Um, and so it condemns the actions of them. And then it's encircling in, as you can see, towards the center and lands with number seven on Judah. Now, when it lands on Judah, uh, the Israelites listening to this were probably uh, thought of appro with approval. They, they weren't too fa big fans of Judah at the time. They'd had some uh, skirmishes with them. Um, but this is where the surprise comes. Instead of dwelling on Judah and its sins, the Lord surprisingly adds on, breaks the pattern, and adds an eighth word of doom. And this word is against Israel, and it's significantly longer than all the others. In fact, as Hoyt has pointed out, even though there is a formula of for three sins, even for four, throughout this passage, you may have noticed that for all of the other nations surrounding Israel, and in, even for Judah, the Lord actually only names one sin, uh, one thing they've done wrong. Sometimes it's in parallel, so it's twice, but there's only one for each of them. But when he gets to Israel, he actually names all four. Uh, so these four sins are named in chapter 2, verse 6 through 8. So in chapter 2, verse 6, we read this. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not relent. They sell the innocent for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. Sin number one. They trample on the heads of the poor as on the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. That's number two. Father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. That's number three. They lie down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. In the house of their God, they drink wine taken as fines. That's sin number four. Douglas Stewart summarizes these sins well when he writes that Israel's crime includes, one, the sale of poor into slavery, two, the oppression of the poor through corruption of justice, three, sexual abuse, and four, the exploitation of those already in debt. And what's worse is that the Israelites sincerely believe that they are still right with God when they're doing all of this. It, this comes especially to the foreground in the image at the beginning of chapter 2, verse 8, where the Israelites are pictured as bowing down beside the altar of the Lord, so they're bowing down in prayer beside the Lord, on top of garments which have wrongfully been taken from the poor. They are praying to God on the cloaks of the poor, that is, on the only piece of clothing that a poor person would have to protect them and keep them warm. And the Lord is furious at them for doing this. He roars at the idea that you and I can come to worship on a Sunday and then completely disregard his commands about how to treat people on Monday. Or to use Jesus' teaching on the greatest commandment as our guide, the Lord is furious with people who believe that they are loving the Lord with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, but then go out and do not love their neighbor as their self. It is this deadly pitfall of divorcing our religious practices, practices like prayer, worship, and Bible study, from our social practices, what we do in our relationships with others with regard to things like money, power, and sex that the book of Amos is especially warning us about. The lion's roar is a wake-up call particularly to devoutly religious people, people who come to church like you and me but who feel free to disregard the Lord's commands about social practices, about how we treat each other. And this is why Amos remains a particularly important book for the church even today. Because nobody comes to church in Victoria unless they want to participate, participate in or at least explore worshiping the Lord. We all come, at least metaphorically, to bow down before the altar of the Lord in worship the question is, when you and I come here to bow down and worship, what are we bowing down on? Do we treat the Lord's commands about money, power, and sex, and what other, other commands he gives about how to relate to each other with seriousness and respect? Or are we bowing down on the garments we have stolen from the poor? Is that what we're worshiping on? Because if that's the case, 
If we are disregarding the Lord's social commands, then the thing we need to hear most from the Lord is a roar, the roar of a lion about to attack, because the Lord has roared. He will not stand for this. And but in his mercy, he has roared before he attacks for the very same reason he did it with Israelites, so that we will have time to wake up to this fact and change before it's too late. The Lord's forgiveness, my brothers and sisters, covers all those who walk the path of repentance, of pursuing obedience to, the, to all of the Lord's commands, even when we fail at them. God does not expect us to yet be perfect, nor does he expect us to change without his powerful help. But he still expects us to be trying to change. And if you have been thinking you can live your life as a Christian while ignoring even some of God's commands about how to act towards others, then this is your wake-up call. The roar the Lord shouts through the book of Amos is especially for you. Because you and I cannot afford to ignore this warning. We cannot afford to ignore the lion's roar. Amen? Amen. Do you please bow with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we ask for your mercy on us, and we know that we get it. That you, through your prophets, are always there to warn us from danger, from warn us going down paths that are dangerous for us. And so, Lord, we pray that you'd help us to take this warning from Amos seriously, that we cannot divide our religious practices from our social ones, that we cannot come here and worship on stolen garments and think that we're pleasing to you. And so, Heavenly Father, if we need to wake up to laws or commands that you've commanded to us that we've been ignoring and thinking that it's just going to be fine, Lord, then we ask that you would wake us up. And Father, if you've already deeply convicted us about these things, then we pray that as we have heard your roar, you would comfort us with your voice and encourage us with your power so that we might be able to change. But Lord, we recognize that that kind of change, that repentance, only comes when we're aware that we need to change. And so, Lord, our prayer is that you would roar, that you would make us aware of where we need to change. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to close this morning by singing one final hymn. And this is a hymn of surrendering everything, all that we are to God. This is hymn number 597, 597, Take My Life and Let It Be. Would you please stand with us as we sing?
As we remember the words and purpose of the book of Amos, I want to close by reminding you of two things. And one is that God has incredible mercy on us uh, when we humble ourselves and are willing to turn and repent. This is imaged in the parable that Jesus has of uh, the Pharisee and the tax collector when they're praying and where the Pharisee beats his breast and knows that he needs to change, knows that he has done wrong. And the Pharisee, in contrast, assumes he's done everything right and even boasts about it before God. And Jesus says it is the tax collector who goes away justified and forgiven. And so know that in this, God's purpose is not to keep you in fear, but it is to bring you to that place, like the tax collector. The second thing I want to remind you and leave you with is the sad news that Israel did not listen to the word of Amos, and that all the things that God warned about in this book, God followed through on. Every single prophecy you heard this morning happened in the end. By 30 years later, 732 BC, or 632 BC, pardon me, uh, Gilead had been taken away by Assyria, and by 722, only 40 years after Amos preached these words, all the rest of Israel was taken away. And so God is serious about this. This is a serious warning call, but it is a warning call that leads us into grace and the goodness and help that comes from God. So go now and heed the lion's roar, knowing that he leads you to repentance to offer you forgiveness and grace. In that knowledge, go in peace and serve your Lord. Amen.